Good evening and welcome to the public meeting of the Halton District School Board for Wednesday, May 16, 2018. I'd like to welcome everyone and remind everyone that this meeting is video voice recorded and live streamed from the hdsb.ca website. I would also like to ask that you turn any devices to silent mode. So we have uh, an absence this evening um, during public session. She may be able to join us a little later and that is uh, Trustee Gray. We are expecting uh, Trustee Graves uh, in a, less than half an hour and Trustee Collard is on the phone. I don't believe any superintendents uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, Superintendent Salmini is not here this evening. I would like to, however, welcome our new Superintendent of Facilities, Maya Puchetti. Welcome, Maya. <laughs> of course, you can say a word. Uh, Maya comes from us from uh, Toronto Catholic where she was an acting associate director and superintendent of facilities and uh, um, she's got a background she has a master's degree in architecture and many other credentials and we very much look forward to working with Maya um, forever <laughs> <laughs> I'd also like to mention that uh, the HDSB is uh, noting denim day today and I've got my denim on and I know a few other trustees have their denim on uh, to recognize breast cancer. Okay, so moving on. Uh, this evening we have trustee Mansour who will be honoring the land. Thank you, Chair Grants. So. Halton, as we know it today, is rich in history and modern traditions of many First Nations and the Métis. From the Anishinaabe to the Ottawa-Duron, the Haudenosaunee, and the Métis, these lands surrounding the Great Lakes are steeped in, in Indigenous history. As we gather today on these treaty lands, we have the responsibility to honour and respect the four directions. Land, waters, plants, animals, ancestors that walked here before us, and all the wonderful elements of creation that exist. We would like to acknowledge and thank the Mississaugas of the New Credit, First Nation, for sharing their traditional territory with us. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Mansour. Are there any declarations of possible conflict of interest? Uh, hold on a second. Seeing none. Could I have a motion to approve the agenda? Uh, Trustee Oliver seconded by Trustee Amos. Is there any discussion on the agenda? Seeing none. All those in favor? We're just voting on the agenda and that passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Okay, we have no delegations for this evening, but we do have two presentations. Uh, first is uh, 231 EDC bylaw public information presentation. So this is the third public meeting in connection with the 2018 Education Development Charges Bylaw that the Board has been considering. The purpose of the meeting this evening was for the Board to pass the new bylaw. As it turns out, however, the Ministry has not yet issued its approval for various assumptions that underlie the determination of the EDC rates. Ministry approval is a condition uh, precedent to the board passing the new bylaw. Ministry staff had, has advised our consultants that they will not be issuing the required approvals until after the provincial general election on June 7th. Our consultant, Jack Amandolia, and legal counsel, Brad Teichman, are here this evening to update the board on the status of the process concerning the proposed bylaw and the likely timing of ministry approval and enactment of the bylaw. Uh, welcome both to the meeting. 
Thank you to the chair. Thanks for the board for having us here again to discuss EDCs. Um, as the chair mentioned, the initial purpose of tonight's meeting was for the trustees or for the board to consider passage of the education development charge bylaw. Um, but however, as was mentioned, um, because of the provincial election coming up, the ministry notified us um, last week, I believe, that the uh, that the approvals wouldn't be forthcoming prior to the election. So um, tonight we're still having a public session um, with with, uh, with regard to the education development charge. Um, there it is. And <laughs> and uh, and what I want to do is I'm just going to go through a couple of things. I will go through some of the requirements and and summarize some of the details that we spoke about um, at the first public meeting. But before I do that, just um, so the trustees and the public are aware, I just want to go through a quick timeline um, and talk quickly about communication that the boards and the consultants had with the ministry, just to to make everyone and to ensure everyone or assure everyone that our our obligations were met with regard to what we had to do. Um, so the Ministry of Education was originally notified that uh, both Halton School Boards would be renewing their EDC bylaws around May or June 2018, and they were notified that the board's bylaws expire in June 2018. The Ministry of Education and the Minister, as was noted, do have to approve the EDC background study, and they must be given 40 clear business days to approve that background study. Oftentimes, we actually, as a courtesy, let them know in advance of those 40 days just that the boards are um, preparing background studies just so the ministry can be proactive and ensure that their staff is available once the background study um, does arrive. And we did do that. Both myself and Mr. Renzella um, contacted the ministry personally to let them know that these studies would be coming. Um, and, and we did this really, I mean, we, we tend to do this with every bylaw, but we noted that um, your board bylaw renewals would be happening very close to provincial elections, so we wanted to be extra proactive in this case to let the ministry know what was going on. At that time, we were notified, both the board and myself as the board's consultant, were notified by the director of the business services branch that the election should not, they actually said would not, impact the EDC approval or timing. Um, so the EDC background study itself was provided to the Ministry of Education on March 15th, 2018. So that was 42 business days um, that we gave them for review. So two days extra in terms of what we legislatively um, had to provide them, the 40 days. And the ministry confirmed receipt through email to us on March 19th, 2018, that the background study was received. Um, I personally contacted the ministry again April 19th, so about a month after we submitted the, minister, uh, the background study, just for a status update to see how the review was going. Did not receive a response. Um, the coterminous board did uh, speak with one of the analysts, um, I think around the beginning of May, um, that the review was ongoing and received no word that we would um, incur any types of delays at that point. I contacted the ministry again on May 7th, 2018, again asking for an update, um, letting them know that the passage was about a week away. I was then called the next day on May 8th, May 8th by the director of the business services branch and he notified me by phone on that day that due to the general election coming up, um, that they were, the business services branch was notified by higher ups that the EDCs may become a provincial political issue and that the ministry wasn't comfortable approving any bylaws or approving any background studies prior to the provincial election. Unofficially, he did say that, um, that the study was basically approved by the assistant deputy minister. I asked the question, what if um, a different minister of education was in, in place after the election? And they were assured, or they assured me that that's not going to impede the process, that the ministry has the power to approve that study outside of the Minister of, of Education. So that's where we're at. Um, and so the hope is that, um, and, and we'll talk about this a little bit at the end, um, but the hope is that after the general election, the ministry approvals come, and then the board meeting, um, the next board meeting, I think is June 20th is what was scheduled, that the board would actually pass the bylaw that night. So just moving on from that, we're gonna go through a couple of the key elements, just a, a quick review of what we talked about at, at the first public meeting. So the education development charge itself is adopted under the Education Act and it enables recovery of growth-related net education land costs only. 
And the important part to take from that is that it's not used for construction of new schools. It's used only to purchase land for new schools to be built on. Boards must meet an eligibility trigger to qualify for EDC. So not every board in Ontario automatically qualifies. And your board does meet that eligibility trigger. The bylaws themselves can be uniform across your jurisdiction or they can be area specific. And right now, your existing bylaw is a uniform rate, so the same rate across the entire jurisdiction. The charge itself can be a single type of charge or a uniform charge dependent on types of development. So one charge for single family homes or apartments, or it can be differentiated between different types of development. Again, your existing bylaw is a uniform charge for all types of development. And the board can allocate education land costs to both residential and non-residential development. The legislation allows boards to allocate anywhere from 0% up to 40% of their cost to non-residential development. Right now, your board allocates 10% to non-residential development, or sorry, 15%. So it's an 85-15 split, and that's approximately average across the province. In terms of, of passing the bylaw, there are certain things that the board has to do before the bylaw can actually be passed. So the background study that we spoke about was one of the requirements, and that's been prepared. The background study was made available to the public at least two weeks prior to the first public meeting, so that was done. We have to hold legislative public meetings and give notice of those public meetings. So notice was provided in local newspapers. It must be provided at least 20 days prior to the first public meeting, and that was done. And we've had two public meetings already, and tonight is a third public meeting that we're having. The background study itself has to be submitted to the Ministry of Education at least 40 days, 40 business days before um, the board considers bylaw passage. So again, if bylaw passage was happening tonight, we've met that requirement by providing 42 business days for review. But since bylaw passage is now actually not going to happen until June, um, we've, we've far exceeded that legislative requirement. And the last one that I have shaded in is the background study. It must receive ministerial approval prior for the, to the board passing. And that's shaded in because that's that last requirement that hasn't been completed yet. In addition to the public meetings, we also had a stakeholder information session. And that's, that's basically not a requirement, but we do that as a courtesy for uh, developers as well as uh, local municipalities, the region, just to let them know about more of the technical aspects of the actual bylaw and to see if, any, if they had any issues. Um, at, that information, it was, at that information session, it was attended by members of municipalities as well as um, Building and Industry and Land Development Associations, that's BUILD. They're an umbrella organization that we spoke about before that represent a good chunk of the developers in Halton Region. Um, after that information session, we received a memo from BUILD on April 27, 2018. The memo addressed um, certain issues with regard to, um, to summarize pupil yields. They had some questions about site preparation costs, as well as uh, some questions about the appraisals. Um, we responded to uh, the memo from BUILD from Altus on May 8, 2018. And then the board actually received a memo today from BUILD that I believe was uh, provided to the trustees, um, basically responding to our last memo. And in a nutshell, they, they had a couple of outstanding um, issues remaining. Um, one didn't have anything to do with your board. One had to do with the coterminous board. And one had to do with classification of stacked townhouses. Um, but basically with, with that memo or that response to that memo, what they said is these are, are issues that they still have, but they feel comfortable not addressing it in this bylaw process, but just to be aware that it might come back up again in the next bylaw process in five years. So generally, as, as most trustees in this room have seen, as build letters go, that was, that was generally pretty positive um, from them. Um, so that, that's it with regard to stakeholder information and process. And just to conclude my part of the presentation tonight, um, so in, in, before that next uh, public meeting when you consider bylaw passage, you will get a staff report that has certain recommendations in that staff report. Right now, and again, unless we hear anything from the public, unless we receive any other memos or feedback, um, the feeling is that in all likelihood, the recommendations will be consistent with your existing bylaws and your previous bylaws. So that's a jurisdiction-wide EDC. That's a uniform rate, not a differentiated rate. And there's a typo on this slide. It should be an 85% residential and a 15% non-residential allocation. 
And just the review, the proposed charge for the residential is going to be $4,892 per unit, and the non-residential charge is $1.11 per square foot of gross floor area. And then just like I said, in terms of next steps, we await ministry approval that we hope we get very soon after the provincial election. At that point, we'll determine if additional meetings are necessary. We've already done that through an internal process. That'll be June 20th, as I mentioned. And then at that June 20th meeting, the trustees will again consider passage of the EDC bylaw. Any questions? Trustee Amos? Thank you, and thank you very much for all the information. Earlier, you had said because of the election, they cannot give approval until June. But there's a possibility it might be another party. So how is that going to possibly impact the decision? Because, I mean, if we can't actually ratify our EDCs, I guess we sit at, do we sit at the old ones until six months, a year from now, depending on? No, so Mr. Teichman could speak to this as well, but the bylaw expires. And once it's expired, you can't extend that bylaw. So it would end on that day if another bylaw wasn't in place to renew it. The only thing I could say is, yeah, we don't have anything in writing, but what the ministry has said, and I believe that, and correct me if I'm wrong, but they may have spoken to the directors or senior staff as well, that this is not going to be dependent on the Minister of Education to sign this thing, that it's an internal ministry matter. And regardless of who the Minister of Education is, that the signature, that the Ministry of Education has the power to sign that through the Assistant Deputy Minister's office. So that's what we've been told, that any change in government, any change in who the Minister of Education actually is, shouldn't impact this signature. So those were the assurances we were given. Thank you very much. That's really good information to know, because I was worried that depending on what happens, it could affect our EDC. Absolutely. That was the first question I asked when I received the phone call. I said, is the ministry aware of when this bylaw expires, and that if the signature isn't received prior to that date, that the board has a non-collection period? Those are the assurances they provided to us. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Director Miller? Through you, Chair Gervantz, through Trustee Amos, I also spoke to the ministry, and the ministry gave me the same information, that this is assured, but not in writing, but I do have the name of the individual who told me, and all that, that this would be passed sometime after the election. I didn't give them the date at that time, but it would be June 20th. Okay. There is no one else on the list. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr. Teichman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amandelli. Thank you very much, Mr.
Two key events were held in early April to help answer questions from staff, students, and the community. Pearson held the town hall on April 4th, which included presentations that focused on remembering a wonderful past while also looking toward a bright and positive future as the two schools officially merge in September 2018. Staff also answered student questions. What I can say is that uh, this is an amazing group of students to have this final year with, so thank you. We hope that our students had a chance to reflect on the past, present, and future of Lester B. Pearson High School, that they had the opportunity to think about what Pearson means to them and what they can bring forward uh, to wherever they're headed next year. And we also hope that it gave them the chance to have their opportunity to speak their minds, get their questions answered, and feel confident moving ahead to next year. What I'm hoping we were able to do today was to build a community and atmosphere that was positive for all the students and let them know that change is hard but it's okay and we're going to help them through the transition um, one step at a time. The things we hope we can bring are our positivity and the way that we have uh, values of patriots and our community being together and making sure that we are okay with each other. Town Hall today at Pearson. I feel really good about it. The purpose in a town hall is student voice. To hear from the students about what they're concerned about and answer their questions directly. And we got to answer inclusively with different representatives, different stakeholders, from staff, from other students, from MM, and from Pearson to all be a part of the solution and make the transition next year as positive as we possibly can. MM Robinson held a community barbecue on April 5th inviting students, their families, and community members to learn more about the transition and the plans for the high school. A really important part of the integration has been communication with all stakeholders, and there are a lot of stakeholder groups that are involved. Tonight, the stakeholder group we're speaking to is the community members, um, parents from Pearson and MM, also invited or anyone that's from the community. Uh, we're having a barbecue first, and then there's an important session in the auditorium to answer questions that they have. So we've collected the FAQs. We're going to talk about the direction of the school. We're going to talk about my vision, um, the school vision, the students, what they've had to say, the focus groups that we've had with students and what the students have put forward as their concerns how we've answered them and how they feel supported. For parents to hear all of those things, hopefully parents feel supported by the end of the evening and they can see the school, set the tone of the school, and they know this has been a great idea, the integration is going well, and it's going to be a really positive thing for those kids for September. Looking forward, the integration committee continues to meet throughout the school a smooth transition. Also, a celebration ceremony June 1st and 2nd. Visit hdsp.ca for more information and details. So that just gives you a little bit of a flavor as to some of the events that have been happening and, and I know that uh, Vice Principal Newcomb can answer some of the questions that you have at the end. Um, what I'd like to do now is to pass it over to, um, if I can move it over. I'm going to pass it over to uh, Vice Principal Newcomb to talk about the Artifacts and Memorabilia Subcommittee. Okay, great. So the committee was a committee of 13 people, four staff members uh, and four alumni, graduating classes ranging from 1982 to 2003. Three current students and then two community members, including the Burlington Curator um, of the Burlington Museum, uh, who was an excellent asset to, to our team. The, um, what I'd like to do is to acknowledge the time and the dedication and the ideas of these folks who uh, came together to preserve Lester B. Pearson High School's legacy. Uh, they did an excellent job and um, um, really helped us to complete our mandate. So our mandate was to one, catalog and inventory all of the artifacts and memorabilia at the school. We ended up cataloging over 800 items. Um, so we successfully completed that piece. And then the other piece was to develop a plan for the different pieces of artifacts and memorabilia um, and to, to identify which pieces would go to MM. So the process uh, that we used for this, we focused, um, the committee focused on the question, uh, what are the most important pieces that represent Pearson High School? And we developed four criteria for that selection process. So uh, the first one, value, so that the item tells the viewer the most information about an event, person, or idea in Pearson's history. 
Second, relevance, the artifact has a direct connection to Pearson's history and community. Rarity, it captures a singular or unique, powerful achievement in Lester B. Pearson's history, or it evokes a, a connection, so a feeling or a pride or a sense of joy about the school. So the artifacts that will be housed at MMR have met all four of these uh, pieces of criteria. So the methods of distribution, there are three avenues for this, this distribution of artifacts memorabilia. The first being going to MMR. The second going to uh, the Burlington Historical Society or the Burlington Museum. And then the third uh, going to alumni, students, staff, um, or folks in the community that have a connection to a piece of, um, of Pearson's history. So the uh, artifacts going to MMR will be placed in a display case outside the new cafeteria. So that will be a, a prominent uh, place in the school, so a busy hallway. And then on the slide, you can see at the, the bottom right corner, Lester B. Pearson Community Theatre. And so this is the location, the main foyer of MMR. You can see the, the panel on the right uh, with the maple leaves. That, that panel is currently in our cafeteria beside our stage. So a very big prominent piece of um, Pearson history coming to MM right in the main foyer. You can also see the brickwork around it. Um, that is in the shape of a maple leaf. So again, uh, Lester B. Pearson, we're uh, the Pearson Patriots, and so our mascot is the maple leaf. So again, a really nice touch that we will be able to see as soon as we walk into the building. The remaining artifacts, um, those that will be available to the community, are available on uh, the Lester B. Pearson Artifacts and Memorabilia website. So here you can see um, there's four categories at the top right corner, hist uh, historical, items, athletics, awards, and arts. And so folks can go on to this website and uh, browse the inventory. And then if they find something that is of interest to them, they can uh, uh, click on the form and then, if you scroll down, um, and then can, they can submit the different requests. So uh, every item is cataloged and labeled and um, uh, they just submit the request name, email address, the catalog number, and we'll be, um, reviewing that at the end of June. The, um, I would like to also thank um, a grade 12 student, Sean Govin, for helping uh, the team in creating this website. So uh, thank you to Sean. And so uh, up to this point, we've had uh, two, over 200 requests for different various items um, from, from the inventory. So it's been quite successful. Thank you. And I'd like to formally acknowledge uh, the work of uh, Vice Principal Newcomb because it has been hours and hours and hours of very careful thought uh, around every item. Um, and under her leadership, they have met and taken great care in, in the selection process and also in ensuring that the artifacts and memorabilia are preserved. And she's worked with the architect a little bit too, so mm -hmm. that's great. Um, and in terms of Lester B. Pearson celebrations, hopefully you have this date in your calendars, June 1st and June 2nd. Uh, at this time, um, there were over 500 responses. Uh, the second subcommittee led by Principal Fedur uh, Federko um, had over 500 responses of ideas and how they'd like to see, how the community would like to see the two-day event unfold. And this is where they are. So on June 1st, you'll see um, that there will be generations tournaments and I found out there's over 150 people as of today that have signed up for those tournaments. Uh, they will be playing against age appropriate uh, <laughs> competitors um, and, and there are so different events. We're hoping for great weather. If not, there is a rain plan. Uh, there'll be lots of food trucks available and socializing and a great opportunity. There's a pep rally with the teen tour band coming on Friday evening and you'll note there, don't forget your lawn chair. Uh, on Saturday, and I know you can read this, but there is a, 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 a lot of events going on. They're going to have Decade Showcase, so there'll be an opportunity for an open house, and community members are welcome to come. Uh, closing ceremonies will begin at 4 o'clock with a reception at 5 o'clock, and you'll see a couple of bullets up there. Um, but uh, one of the things that you don't see is that there's, uh, there are some very special guests that will be attending that day. And uh, the committee has secured Lester B. Pearson's granddaughter, Canadian writer and journalist Patricia Pearson. They've got the founding principal, David Katz, coming, uh, Lester B. Pearson alumni, 
and renowned Canadian singer-songwriter Sarah Harmer will sing O Canada. So they've been doing a lot of work uh, in terms of preparing for the celebration. And as you've seen in the past, there are Celebrate LBP, there's a lot of social media, there's a website that's available, Facebook and Twitter. And for those of you out there that are Lester B. Pearson, it might flash up or not, Lester B. Pearson alumni or community members, if you have pictures that you'd like to share, please email those to memories at celebratelbp.com. And there are a few uh, samples that are available at this time. Uh, the next thing that I'd like to quickly share is uh, about, uh, talking about, thank you. Thank you. Uh, talking about students with special education needs and some of the transition plans that are occurring. Maybe you could just hold that, Gord. <laughs> Uh, and I'll speak to it. Uh, the, the students uh, with special education needs, currently the uh, acting program lead at, at Lester B. Pearson will be the program lead at M.M. Robinson next year. Uh, his name is Corey Trod, and that's exciting news for uh, the community. And, and as I said, the schools in the past, that the schools will be working closely together. The leadership team are a combination of Lester B. Pearson and M.M. staff. Uh, the process around prescribed technology has, uh, is ongoing and it follows the same process that we use uh, throughout the board where technology follows students regardless of their location. Uh, tours are going to be made available for all students. There have been tours in the past and you heard the students last uh, meeting that they were here talk about those tours. This Friday, for example, is an opportunity for students from Lester B. Pearson to have individualized tours, tours with families. I know there was a tour today, I think that you were speaking to earlier, uh, Ms. Newcomb, around uh, an opportunity for a family that couldn't make it on Friday. So there's lots of, of uh, uh, welcoming opportunities for kids and their families. Uh, transition plans, they're working closely on those. Uh, as mentioned at the SEAC meeting last week, um, there are waiver forms being signed by families so that uh, staff from both schools have the opportunity now to start sharing information. And uh, an exciting update around the outdoor learning space that will be created at M.M. Robinson this summer. Um, a lot of work and input and I know the design is very small and very detailed. Uh, but there is a, a, a great opportunity or a great plan uh, to have an outdoor learning space, not only for students in the Community Pathway Program, but for all students at M.M. Robinson. And one of the things in, in the work that was done in the design was recognizing the great technology programs at M.M. Robinson and the opportunity to have students uh, contribute uh, key items or, or activities to that space and, and build it as a community. So that's something exciting in terms of students contributing to that design. A uh, question has come up in the past and I'd just like to put it out there that HSTS, Halton Student Transportation Services, uh, the eligibility is now available for the fall. So if families are wondering whether their students are eligible for Busing, it is now available and earlier than usual, uh, May 1st, open online courtesy seat applications. So for families, and that's not only the Lester B. Pearson community, but anybody in Halton. And that was new. Uh, the next thing, very quickly, and we're almost done. Uh, on April 19th, we had uh, the opportunity to have uh, over 70 people from the community, um, from our education uh, partners, uh, post-secondary, uh, within our board, our program leaders, we had nonprofit groups, we had people from industry. Um, this came out of a, a, an opportunity or a, co a recommendation from the Aldershot Committee to say, this was great that we've engaged all these people, uh, wouldn't it be great to have them back? And so I'm just gonna share uh, a video and I'm hoping it will be a little bit smoother than the last one uh, of that day just for your information. iSTEM really is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. 
We also thought about innovation and a focus on innovation, but it's really how are we improving or creating things that will make our world better in terms of economic, environmental, and in society. And I think many of you in this room have a significant investment in that area. This actually has an opportunity to be, a, I think, a game changer in Canada. We can build from the ground up a program that could be a magnet and a demonstration site in all of Canada. I love the word I STEM because it's got the STEM and then it's got the I for innovation. And one key thing that I would really suggest continue to reinforce is the fact that it's the I that drives the STEM and not the other way around. Very often we think of STEM technologies, new sciences and technologies as being the driver for changes and impact in society. And I think that's the actually holding the stick from the wrong end. I think it's innovation and I mean by that empathy to the marketplace, empathy to the environment, empathy to society to solve those problems, to create economic growth, to create positive environmental and social impact, and then work ourselves backward to what are the stems that need to come in place to realize that. We can have creative, critical thinkers who are strong citizens who can be positioned to solve some of the biggest challenges facing the world. So I'm really excited to be part of the initiative. So I'd like to give a shout out to Kevin Raposo who put that recap together. Um, I know that uh, you know the work of Kevin and the Communications and Information Services Department, but they have done a great job in, in helping us engage and, and communicate some of the messaging. Um, we had some really great discussions with the people. Um, you'll see the people that are on the screen, but there were many more that weren't uh, captured there. Um, that we've got feedback from and our next steps really are next uh, week we're actually meeting with staff at Aldershot to, to look at designing what does a four-year program uh, look like for iSTEM and what are the courses that students will be taking. Uh, we want to talk about some staff learning. We know that staff has already signed up for some opportunities to learn in the summer uh, which speaks to the professionalism of our staff at Aldershot. Uh, and then we're going to re-engage our stakeholders again and say, this is what we're thinking, how can you help? And uh, we've got a lot of interest, you'll see McMaster, Mohawk, uh, post-secondary partners, um, and uh, we're really excited. We don't know where we're going to land yet, but we're, we're getting closer, and uh, we have a year of really building an amazing opportunity for our students and, and hopefully spreading that uh, throughout the board. And the last thing that I have to share, uh, just with Robert Bateman, I know there's been a lot on iSTEM and there's been a lot on Lester B. Pearson and M.M. Robinson. We have been dealing with, uh, we have been talking a lot about the work in involving uh, Robert Bateman, Nelson and Burlington Central. Uh, for the upcoming school year, just for your awareness, uh, Paul Daniel is a uh, principal that has been appointed at Nelson High School for this September. And Paul comes with many experiences in a composite setting. He's worked at White Oak Secondary School and is currently the principal at Georgetown High School. Um, so we're excited that he will be working uh, closely through that transition process with staff and students at Bateman. Uh, we also know that Burlington Central students, all students will be attending uh, Burlington Central High School from Tecumseh effective September and uh, that's good for the cohort of, at Tecumseh to stay together and uh, that there will be some construction started throughout the year at Nelson but we'll be able to provide more updates on that as we go through because it'll be great to capture some of the great things that are being constructed not only at Nelson but M.M. Robinson. So at this time that's all that I have to share with you. There's uh, as you know a lot of work going on but uh, I, I do want to acknowledge the, the, the work of the subcommittees and the integration committee at Lester B. Pearson and M.M. Robinson. Um, people are working tireless, tirelessly on this and uh, the principals in both schools and, and the vice principals in both schools are really uh, doing much of the work and ensuring that kids are, and staff are feeling great moving forward. Thank you very much. There are a few speakers. So the first is Trustee Pappen. Thank you through the chair to Superintendent uh, Blackwell and uh, Vice Principal 
Newcomb, um, I just wanted to thank you for all your hard work. Um, Superintendent Blackwell has given us many excellent updates, but uh, it's nice to be able to thank uh, Vice Principal Newcomb, especially your many hours that you've put in on this and uh, the artifacts and memorabilia. I think that's really great, you know, the extent that you've gone to to make this work. So um, thank you very much. I also wanted to uh, mention that I'm really glad the transportation is up because I've had a lot of comments from parents regarding whether their kids will be bused, and so that's good to know as well. So thank you. Trustee Collar. Um, thank you. Yes, yeah. I got a couple of questions. Uh, one is specifically about how laid in stone are the plans, because uh, tr um, Trustee Pappen and I both received an email from a gentleman who had some really good ideas about what might be done at the gym and with the physical and health education facilities. And while it might go above and beyond what we've been funded for, he, he's afraid that we might proceed with some things and then need to up, undo them later. Director Miller. Through you, Chair Grabance, to Trustee Collard. I believe I received the same email, and it's about the Nelson facility, correct? Yes. Right. Um, and um, for the um, uh, trustees here, the, the, the gentleman, that I actually had a couple of emails around it, um, suggested um, a complete renovation of the gym and some other facility enhancements to Nelson. At this time, the, the scope of the project at Nelson does not allow for those. Um, as you know, we are spending, uh, we were given about $10.5 uh, $10 million from the province in renovations for Nelson, and we've been able, we will be able to access another uh, probably $5 million of our build capacity money for a total of about 15, somewhere between 15 and 16 million dollars for renovations at Nelson. Uh, at this point in time, the scope of the project, that money will be subsumed in, in uh, tech areas, the CPP, and so on. The individual has made a very good point. When you're doing renovations, it would be great to be able to do all the other work at the same time because you're doing it. Uh, unfortunately, at this time, um, we do not have the money put aside and we'd have to take it from somewhere else to do that Nelson project. And our facility services has uh, looked at the gym and has not recommended that the gym be uh, completely renovated this time. They also suggested a new uh, a bubble over the turf field. Um, most of the bubbles that exist in Halton and in fact in um, the GTA are as a result of partnerships with municipalities or cities, et cetera, and so on. And as you'll recall, some time ago, we were having conversations with uh, Burlington City Council, well, not council, but staff around uh, enhancements to the uh, turf field at Nelson. And uh, I'm, those are kind of in abeyance at the moment. So to answer your question directly, Trustee Collard, and I, I did send a response to the gentleman that sent me the emails that at this time we would not be going forward with those uh, projects, however good the point is that he made. So, Okay, thank you. Can I follow up? Yes, you may. I also had a question. I'm getting an echo. Sorry. I had a question about the therapy pool. Uh, people were wondering specifically what was the reason that we didn't proceed. Through you, Chair, through you, Chair Drabens, um, I will turn it over to um, um, Superintendent Zonnefeld to answer that question. I, I do want to remind that we that in the original process we said we would investigate the possibility of doing a therapy pool. So, um, go ahead, Superintendent. Uh, through the chair to Trustee Collard. So we um, investigated the use of therapy pools in other boards you know, in the GTA area and also had uh, conversations with 
phys uh, physiotherapists, uh, all of which uh, led us down the path of, of realizing that uh, in <coughs> We, we, well, first, we couldn't find other boards that were using therapy pools. And in fact, um, some boards had re removed them from their facilities. And that uh, correlated with what the uh, physiotherapists were telling us was that uh, this wasn't the work that this should, should happen in school boards, that this, this is the work that happens uh, in hospital settings and other therapy settings, uh, home as well, uh, but not in schools. And that... Um, there are other ways that we can support students in their needs for uh, different types of therapy uh, in their classrooms, in other types of rooms within those, within those programs and not in a pool setting. And then combined with that, there were uh, challenges that we had in terms of safety of students and staff uh, in, those, in those pool settings uh, in terms of their ability to support students um, and uh, ensure that everyone's safety. So uh, all of that led us to, to recommend that we don't put a therapy pool in at Nelson. Thank you very much. Can I ask one more? I guess so, yes. Um, with respect to the parking lot at Nelson, uh, again, I'm getting concerns about safety and I'm wondering what w wiggle room we have I know we've asked the question before, but it keeps coming up. Uh, through the chair to Trustee Collard, um, thank you for the question. We have talked about this, and one of the things that I believe it was actually at your Super Council meeting, we talked about uh, opportunities for uh, a very purposeful uh, uh, use of the integration committee in, in developing a communication plan with families um, and working uh, kind of training uh, families as they as we open the new facility. We did look at the driveway. We know that there is an extension to the existing driveway, and we also, uh, as answered at a, a prior board meeting, uh, we know that there are schools, uh, White Oaks as an example, where the front of the school entrance is very similar, and uh, we have great practices that we can build upon and, and are confident that we will be able to uh, work with families and, and make sure students are safe. Um, I, I guess the other point in, in that is just uh, reminding people that when some of our students that belong, that uh, are in the CPP area are supported uh, and greeted by educational assistants uh, daily and uh, there are a lot of safety measures in place and, and we trust in, in the work that they do. Thank you very much. And through you, Chair Drabentz, to Trustee Collard, you said, is there any wriggle, uh, wiggle room in this? Uh, insofar as these are the preliminary designs, there's always a little bit, a wee bit of wiggle, wiggle, wriggle, wriggle room. There's, <laughs> there's space that, uh, that can be looked at at a uh, later time if, if it's deemed necessary and money's available. Thank you very much. Trustee Amos. Thank you. I'd like to thank you very much for your report. It's, it's great to hear all the wonderful things that are happening in all the locations. And I liked one of the quotes from one of the students that said, it's scary, but it's going to be okay. And that's exactly, I mean, we know that all the supports are being put into place. And with all the exciting things that are happening, I'd like to thank everybody on the teams that are part of it, because it is very exciting times. And the second part of my question has to do around the whole PAR. Someone recently um, asked me, um, they had heard that there may be um, a move afoot um, for the next board to possibly reconsider the motions we made around the PAR process. And I know under Robert's rules, you cannot reconsider or amend or rescind a motion that has already um, has uh, um, at some action taken place on it. But I also believe this is a little more complex because um, we've gone through a process. And I would like um, either the director or the chair to confirm my thoughts because I believe that because of the PAR process that we went through, the extensive consultation, and the fact that we um, were all 
um, we had to follow a specific process before we could even vote, that it was a much more complex process than a simple vote, and so therefore can probably not be overturned. Through you, Chair Gravens, to Trustee Amos and to all trustees, um, you're, you're correct in identifying the complexities of the PAR process. As a result of uh, that, um, um, we have received a, a legal opinion on the ability to reverse by a, a, a subsequent board of trustees the PAR process. And it is um, um, the opinion, the legal opinion, that it can only be overturned by a court. So it can't be overturned by another board of trustees unless there's a pursuit in court. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, and that's what I had shared with the person who had asked me the question, but I wanted to make sure I was correct in what I had said. So thank you. Okay, thank you. There are no more speakers. Uh, thank you very much for this update. Uh, I was, uh, I noticed on the, um, Twitter feed that uh, there is a new Spiritwear logo for M.M. Robinson for next year. Uh, did you want to elaborate on that a little bit and how it came to be? Sure. Um, the Student Voice Subcommittee got together and one of their uh, items was to design to new Spiritwear. And so they came up with a couple different designs and then students of both schools voted on them. So they ended up with um, uh, Pearson uh, our our um, mascot is the Pearson Patriot, the Maple Leaf. So it's a Maple Leaf with the Rams head out front and an MMR over top. So um, a nice combination of both schools. Sounds wonderful. Thank you very much for your great report. Okay, now we're up to consent agenda items. Uh, do we have any items that require discussion? Trustee Harvey Hope. Uh, I have a question on the order paper, quick, and uh, more intensive questions on the capital update. So two out of three. Does anybody else have anything? Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the motion on the floor and then we'll discuss those items, okay? So be it resolved that the All Home District School Board approve the consent agenda action items and receive the information items for May 16, 2018. Moved by Trustee Pappen, seconded by Trustee Amos. And I know that there is discussion. So if you'd like to uh, move forward with what you have to say. Uh, Trustee Harvey Hope. Thank you. Um, on the order paper, I had a question about um, the shaded area, um, M150139. Um, I understand that we've done what the motion says, but I was curious about uh, the first part, committing all the students graduating with knowledge, how we were going to ensure it continues rather than we've committed now, but how we ensure the commitment stays. And two, I believe the reason why we can take that one off is because we are talking about embedding it in the bylaws as far as the acknowledgement. So if I'm correct on both of the, on the second part, I'm just curious about um, how we're going to ensure that we can show our commitment going forward once it's off the order paper. Director Miller. Through you, Chair Gravens, to uh, Trustee Harvey Hope, you're correct on the second part. Um, that's the intent. Um, but that's also related to the first part. It is difficult, uh, the way it's worded, committed that all students graduate with knowledge, it's, it's, it's difficult to uh, um, test that unless we test that, and we won't be testing it. But the fact that we will be acknowledging the land in all of our schools, and truth and reconciliation is part of the curriculum, we can guarantee that all of our students, every single one of them will be exposed to curriculum uh, and um, uh, the issues the issues are raised in the Truth and Reconciliation Report. And I'm going to look to uh, Superintendent Etoff to elaborate on that. So, um, uh, Through the Chair, uh, we have um, a report actually coming to the Board in June uh, that will uh, highlight and, and outline 
um, and hopefully provide uh, further answers with, with respect to your question um, around, uh, around the education pieces uh, related to uh, a truth and reconciliation uh, well beyond what we're doing um, with the um, uh, with the land acknowledgement, uh, but but what we're doing through the new uh, curriculum initiatives uh, that have come down from the ministry. Um, we've currently, uh, teachers are being trained, and uh, implementation of that curriculum um, will be, uh, be be taking place uh, fall of 2019. Um, is that is that good? Thank you. Okay. Correction: That's the fall of 2018. Uh, Vice Chair L. Harrison. Thank you. Through you, Madam Chair, just briefly, um, this motion for me represents one of the high points of the last few years. Um, and I really appreciate all of the work that has gone into um, making this real for students. And I just wanted to ask, I think it will be to Superintendent Etoff, but whether the intent is to continue with the annual report that kind of fell out of this motion. Uh, uh, through the chair, um, we uh, uh, the intent is uh, actually to incorporate um, uh, in in a visionary way through the uh, equity and inclusive education uh, board policy is to update that policy to ensure. Uh, that the tenets uh, uh, of, the, of the board and the expectations of the board around uh, truth and reconciliation and indigenous education are embedded into our equity inclusive education policy. Uh, they're currently not, uh, so we're in the pro uh, we're in the process of, of revising our policy and bringing we'll bring that uh, to the board uh, probably in the early fall, um, and in and in doing so. Um, I think the expectation is that um, uh, a report, uh, uh, an annual report, uh, may may no long, may no longer be be required because it would then be embedded within our within our board policies. But also let the director um, speak to that if he wishes. Um, I just have a couple of comments to add, though, um, and I'm really directed at all trustees. I think uh, I do do not disagree with trust. Uh, Vice Chair Al Harrison around the significance of this motion that was put forward. Um, we, we need to address and, and be accountable for the wrongs that were committed many, many years ago and um, make amends for those. And uh, to that end, um, we've done a number of stuff in the, in the schools and continue to do a number of things in the schools. But we are looking at now, and we are in the preliminary planning processes. We've booked the location and booked the date for a symposium on Indigenous and First Nations issues for adults, uh, educators, and, and whoever else. Principal Mary Marshall will be involved, and Superintendent Etoff in the Equity Department, but so will many of the trustees around this table be on the planning committee, and we will be doing that to continue to, uh, to recognize the significance of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we had, uh, for the capital update, you had some questions, Trustee Harvey. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. Um, yes, I um, just a few comments to highlight things that were, as I was going through it, a little unclear. Um, the capital update with financials is based on March 31st, 2018, which is the provincial um, year end. And so, and I've confirmed this with Superintendent Veerman, but she may be able to explain it better than I can. Um, these charts, although the overview report says it's not accrued, they are accrued. So that's just the, the beginning. Um, but there are some, um, the, I, I point out that people should really look at the notes on the bottom. Um, in my copy, they're really small print, but they, they blow up quite well on the screen um, because it does explain a lot of things. Um, one of the points that has, I think my question probably got answered in the presentation, but the MMR and the Nelson PAR renovations are not quite included in these capital reports yet. Um, so there are 
some hints in the notes about some numbers and the director Miller um, talked about a couple of pieces of the build capacity moving over and the, the, the months that got um, approved. So just to say, wait for it, the next uh, iteration of this report, which will come out in um, for the end of June, should have all of those numbers in there. Um, so sometimes it's a question of when we have this report and what its date is as of. So um, because I know a few people are really interested in knowing all the information about what's happening with Nelson and, and MMR, and right now there is like a blank where it says budget, and yet we've seen some numbers floating around. So just to, just to highlight that the numbers have changed a little bit. Um, and, uh, but my question was um, about the ED, I guess the EDC, if we have savings for EDC, it just goes back into the EDC, right? I guess that my question was probably for Superintendent Veerman. Um, so if we have build capacity savings, it stays in build capacity, but if we have EDC eligible um, savings, it's, it just gets absorbed into the EDC amount. Uh, through the chair, that is correct. Through you, Chair Gravens, to uh, Trustee Harvey Hope's question around the um, uh, Nelson and MM uh, renovations. As I said already in earlier, but I'll, I'll uh, repeat it. Ten and I, we got almost $11 million, $10.8 million or something for Nelson renovation, and we got an additional $4 million for a renovation at MMM Robinson. If you look at the bottom of, of uh, Appendix C, we will also be able to access seven million five hundred ninety-four thousand two hundred twenty-four thousand um, dollars, um, if needed, for those projects. Thank you. You have twenty-four seconds. Just a, a heads up to um, Superintendent Veerman on uh, Appendix D, Note Two. It talks about ministry needing uh, doesn't need approval if it's a renewal type. So the way I read that is if we just give them the list of approved projects at some point that covers off that check the box because we're not going to get approval in advance because they're all going to qualify under the renewal dollars. Uh, through the chair, um, a number of years ago, uh, there was a report that was brought forward to the trustees um, requesting or providing direction to request to the ministry that we use some of these dollars for our projects. At that time, we did receive that approval from the ministry, which is a reason that it uh, is noted as such. Okay, seeing no more speakers to that, I'm gonna call the question. Uh, so this is the approval of, con of the consent agenda. Okay, all those in favor? And that passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Okay, we are now up to our ratification action items. Vice Chair L. Harrison, do we have any business from private session that requires, requires approval? Yes, we do. There are two items. Item number one, uh, be it resolved that the Halton District School Board approve the resolutions from report 18081, private session, May 16th, 2018, respecting personnel matters. And I so move. Seconder. Uh, okay. Trustee um, Oliver and seconding. Oh, she moved it. She seconded it. And I apologize. It should be report 0078. Oh, that's report 07078 instead of the other one that was just mentioned. <laughs> okay. So is there any discussion at all? I didn't think so. Okay, so. Oh, 
We just need a moment of technical difficulties. All those in favor? Oops. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> and that passes unanimously. Thank you very much. And there's a second item as well. Uh, be it resolved that the Halton District School Board approve the resolution from Report 18081, private session, May 16th, 2018, respecting labor relations. And I so move. Do I have a seconder? Trustee Pappin? Any discussion? Seeing none. Um. All those in favor. And that passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Okay, we have two action items this evening. The first is number 421, governance policies. And I'll read the motion on to, um, Put it on the floor. Be it resolved that the board approve the recommendations provided by Miller Thompson and Associates regarding the director's job description and the delegation of authority and executive limitations. Be it further resolved that the board authorize the director to employ the services of Miller Thompson and Associates to produce the operational leadership policy recommended in report 18073 as soon as is practical for subsequent approval by the board of trustees. Moved by. I'd like to move that, please. Okay, seconded by uh, Trustee Harvey Hope. Um, Trustee Collard, would you like to speak to that? Uh, I think it's been pretty self-explanatory. If anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer. Okay, Trustee Harvey Hope. Um, thank you. Um, I agree with the... Uh, <clears throat> Just of the motion. I just have a uh, reading it again for the umpteenth time this afternoon. Um, I'm wondering whether or not we are approving the recommendations or accepting the recommendations. So I'm wondering about that verb. And also, there's no word, um, I think we're missing the word policies after executive limitations because it just, just sort of doesn't say what it is. Um, so, regarding job description and the delegation of authority and executive limitations. Policies. I think we're talking about through policies where we're going to change them, throw them out, whatever. Um, but it's not the limitations themselves. It's actually the policies. Okay, so... Yes, it's the policies. Okay, so we'd like to amend the word policies on the end? I'd like to add the word policies. And I'm, I'm wondering about the word approve versus accept because um, the recommendations... And if we are going to say approve, then I'm wondering whether there's a different way to embed it. Um, because we're approving recommendations in a motion without the recommendations in the motion. The recommendations are in the report, and granted the report's not that long, but accepting is a little bit different than approving. I'm amenable to changing the verb. Thank you. And since I seconded, I'm also good with amending the word. Okay, do I, um, is there any discussion about those amendments at all? Seeing none, so um, I will read it again. And um, be it resolved that the board accept the recommendations provided by Miller, Thompson, and Associates regarding the director's job description and the delegation of authority and executive limitation policies. Be it further resolved that the board authorize the director to employ the services of Miller Thompson and Associates to produce the operational leadership policy recommended in report 18073 as soon as practical for subsequent approval by the board of trustees. Okay, so I guess we're okay to vote for that on that. Okay. All those in favor? Mm -hmm. 
and that passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Okay, next up is uh, number 422, policy framework. So I will read this motion to put it on the floor. Be it resolved that the halt, oops, sorry. Be it resolved that the board approve the recommendations provided by Miller Thompson and Associates regarding the policy framework, policy, and the policy and procedure numbering format. Be it further resolved that the board authorize the director to employ the services of Miller Thompson and Associates to produce the policy framework policy as recommended in report 18074 as soon as is practical for subsequent approval by the board of trustees. I would like to move that, and I would also like to change the verb approve to accept. Uh, Trustee Harvey Hope? I'd like to second it. Okay. And I've got other comments, so I'll put my name on the list. Okay. Try that again. Put your name back on the list. Trustee Harvey Hope. Thank you for the first part that I was about to say, so thank you for changing that to accept. Um, also, um, there, the report is a little vague on the numbering format, so, and there's no bring back a template or something, because I don't know whether that just means the recommendations of the B and the A is what's going ahead or what. So um, I'm assuming that we might have, see the numbering format before it's a fait accompli, but. Um, Again, because the report has a lot of mays, shoulds, considers, it's not a do X, Y, Z, and we're saying, yes, we're gonna do X, Y, Z. There's a lot of, as Director Miller referred to earlier, wiggle room. So um, I'm, I'm just wondering when we're gonna, what we're gonna see is the actual thing that we'd be approving. May I respond? Sure. Um, it, it will require approval by the Board of Trustees so if we're not happy with the numbering format, we can change it. And that's a, that would go with any of the changes. Okay, so we have a friendly amendment to change that word to accept. Do you need me to read it out again or? No. No, we're okay? Okay, so there's nobody else on the speakers list, so we're gonna vote. I just wanna make sure I have the right, nope. That's the one. Okay, all those in favor? And that passes unanimously, thank you very much. Okay, so now we are up to communications to the board and we start off with our student trustee reports. So this might be one of the shortest student trustee reports you guys ever get to tune in for. Um, so starting off, we are continuing work on our Halton Youth Leadership Symposium. I believe it's our 17th year running this. So it's a, quite a Halton tradition. Um, at this point, we've contacted all elementary schools uh, to get students to register for the conference. And we have our two speakers confirmed. One of them will be the mayor of Burlington, Mayor Goldring, and the other one, our very own Director Stuart Miller. Um, so the Halton Youth Leadership Symposium will be on May 31st, um, and we've created a Senate meeting before the 31st just so we can plan with our Student Senate before then to finalize like all the workshops and all the other things that the Student Senators will be doing, um, including, for example, a student voice piece, which is essentially like what we do at Student Senate, discussing student issues, but with the students who attend the conference so that we can branch out into more students, and also running like a what is Student Senate, what is the student trustee position, um, presentation so that we can branch out to more students as to what those positions are. So that next Senate meeting will be Tuesday, May 22nd, about a week from now, and we'll be finalizing the details. Um, and then our final thing to report is that we will be attending the OSTA ACO uh, final conference of the year, the annual general meeting, um, which will be from May 24th uh, to May 27th. Um, and that will be myself and Muktasit as well as our two new incoming student trustees who will be attending uh, the conference and we're really looking forward to that. We found out recently um, that we've confirmed Mark Kielberger as one of our keynote speakers for the event. So we're really excited to have him um, and obviously I'm sure there'll be more happening uh, for that, as, uh, that event as well. Thank you.
Okay, next we are up to our action items for June 6th. Um, so uh, the first item is number 521, Audit Committee. Uh, Superintendent Bierman, report 18082, page 72 with full package. Trustee Harvey Hope. Thank you. Um, so uh, the audit committee chair, Jean Gray, is unavailable to attend this part of the meeting, so she asked me to um, answer any questions if necessary. Um, so the audit committee um, report is to approve the internal audit, um, the audit plan for the external auditors, as well as the regional internal audit plan which includes audits of special education with the scope to be determined and continuing education. And the audit committee um, did a slight revision on the original plan to include special education because we had been trying to do that for a while. And we thought that with the current um, s progress of the special education review, um, that a, we might be able to get to the point where we could actually schedule that one. Um, and we have some ideas on possible scoping, uh, Superintendent Zonfeld and the director and the audit committee itself, as well as any interested trustees. We'll all have some input into this. Um, what we're thinking more of a process based than um, program based. So not what children with special education needs are getting, but whether or not um, deadlines and paperwork and those kinds of processes, if they're being those kinds of testings and that kind of stuff. So that was the idea, um, and um, that's what um, uh, the conversation went to in the audit uh, committee, uh, specifically the audit committee members. And uh, I know, if I may, Trustee uh, Graves um, w wanted to make sure this kind of got got into into the hopper, and uh, so we wanted to start getting that going. So. Um, if there's any other questions that, like I said, it's still a work in progress, but the idea is that we need to give them an idea of what areas to look at and then they come back with a scoping plan. So um, between now and when this gets approved, um, if anybody has any questions, um, feel free to contact Trustee Gray or me or Superintendent Beerman. We do have a speaker on the speakers list, Trustee Collard. Thank you. I'm a little bit concerned about the special education audit. I'm glad to hear that we're going to be focusing on pro process, but I would like to see the plan. Uh, it says spoke to be determined. I would like to see the plan before it's carried out. Director Miller. Through you, Chair Grabenz, to Trustee Collard. Uh, it's, uh... Uh, an excellent point that you raise, and I, we, uh, we certainly understand some of the concerns that trustees would have around a special education audit in terms of privacy of students and IEPs and all that. Uh, we have been assured by the regional internal auditor, and we even changed the wording of the agreement we, they had with them to protect the privacy of our, our students and their IEPs. And as uh, um, Trustee Harvey Hope says, it's around process. Mm -hmm. um, I look to um, the scope will be developed in conjunction with um, uh, Superintendent Zonnefeld and then brought to the audit committee, which trustees are welcome, but we can certainly bring that to the board as well sometime after it's been at the audit committee before the work begins. Uh, I, I believe I'm correct in that, uh, Superintendent Beerman and uh, Trustee Harvey Hope. So th the answer to your question is yes. I guess. Thank you. I was also wondering if it might be brought to SEAC. Trustee Harvey Hope. Um, my gut reaction will be probably no, um, because this is an internal audit matter. Um, so the trustees would be involved and the management would be involved and Superintendent Zonville will be involved. Um, they will be um, likely informed of 
the broad strokes, but not specifically given the scope, just like we wouldn't give um, a school the scope of an audit for one of their, their internal audits. Um, the, uh, the mandate and the extra protections for um, the uh, confidentiality has been a hot topic and that will not, um, we won't let up on that particular piece. Um, and as well, uh, this particular topic, definitely um, the audit committee wants to see it flushed out before work is started, so. Thank you very much. Okay, there are no more speakers on this topic, so we'll move on to the next topic. Oh, Mark, sorry, Mark, go ahead. Uh, through the chair to trustees, I might suggest that once the, the parameters of the audit are are established that some sharing with, with SEAC, um, I, I encourage you to consider that, um, knowing that eventually the outcomes of the audit will be something uh, that may be public uh, and whatever that looks like at the end. So for SEAC to not hear about it until then, uh, they would appreciate knowing you know, something at the, at the front end. Trustee, have you help? Um, that, that, sorry, um, Superintendent Batson, that I didn't mean that they wouldn't hear about anything that was going on until after the fact and they got the report. I, I meant that um, their input can be sought and through you bringing it forward to us on kinds of things that once we have an idea and through you coming to us um, with the audit committee and in consultation with the director and Superintendent Behrman and, and at all the other parties. Um, it's just that the actual scope itself would be remain in a private format. So um, involved, yes, but actually seeing the scope document, no. I think is how I would go down on that one. Okay, everything seems copacetic at this point. Okay, so uh, number 522, Aldershot Capital Renewal Work. Associate Director Bogue, welcome. Thanks, Madam Chair. I think this could be my last official facilities duty. <laughs> um, through you, Madam Chair, to trustees, this uh, report outlines some work uh, required uh, for at, um, at Aldershot High School to get it prepared for the implementation of the iSTEM program. I think as trustees can see, uh, we are looking for support to um, allocate $1.475 million for this work. I just wanna clarify for both trustees and for the public, these funds um, would come out of renewal dollars. Each year our board receives some pretty significant capital re renewal money and trustees may recall when we brought the list of projects from this year, um, the total amount was in the ballpark of around $38 million. And we typically go through a pretty comprehensive process in terms of prioritizing what work needs to be done where, we get input from principals and field supervisors, that sort of thing. What this is really asking for, because we know that this work needs to be done and we have a timeline that we need to meet, is to allocate these dollars uh, up front and then the rest of the renewal allocation um, uh, process would still occur next year to, re to allocate the remaining dollars. So. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, that trustees uh, would have. We do have someone on the speaker's list, uh, Trustee Reynolds. Uh, thank you, through the chair. Um, I, I appreciate that uh, you, you, you commented about where the funds are coming from because I would think the community would wanna know that this is not coming on the backs of a school closure that uh, these funds have been um, uh, uh, given to us through the ministry and that uh, we are going to apportion them here. I certainly um, support this, this project and I, I have one question. Um, the report speaks to um, that the, the facility uh, renewal project will benefit the entire school and the community and I'd like to know what, you're, what uh, is meant by the community and how the community would be um, able to, to, to uh, take advantage of these, uh, these developments. Uh, thanks, uh, Trustee Le Reynolds. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, Trustee Reynolds, I'll start and maybe trust, uh, Superintendent Blackwell will provide a more comprehensive uh, answer. I, I think the community piece is, is what we're developing here is really something that would be accessible to 
um, kids beyond the immediate Aldershot community, and in fact, to the entire uh, uh, school community. And so that was, I think, the initial intent, and I'll look over to uh, Superintendent Blackwell to maybe provide a little uh, further clarification. Thank you. Through the chair to Trustee Reynolds, uh, one of the things that we did do prior to the uh, iSTEM decision was we did uh, uh, many tours to different facilities, uh, Tech Place in Burlington. We looked at uh, the iHub in, in District School Board of Niagara, and one, and one of the things that we did see was opportunities for the community to use the space similar to some of the libraries in, in Burlington and, and Halton as well. <laughs> Um, so we, we envision that that uh, will be an opportunity and within the hub space we're actually constructing a washroom um, and a, a door for the outside um, to purposely have that space accessible to community outside of, of school hours as well. Okay, Vice Chair L. Harrison. Thank you very much. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, just a couple of quick questions around the uh, dollar allocation. I just wondered what was included in Innovation Hub and Consulting Services? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, to Trustee L. Harrison, the Consulting Services, and I, I received a couple of questions about that, is really around architectural services. And with any any uh, uh, significant renovation, that sort of thing, we do use architects to uh, to start that work and help us with the planning. So that's that piece. I'm going to look over to uh, Superintendent Blackwell once again to talk a little bit more about what the Innovation Hub is is likely to look like. Uh, so through the chair to Trustee, or sorry, uh, Co-Chair Al Harrison. Uh, one of the things that we have started to do, as I mentioned, was look at what does the learning actually look like in, in that space. And as we develop the program, uh, we've looked at uh, some, some specialty classrooms that already exist across our board and uh, had our facility staff do some um, estimates around if the space looked like this, what would the cost be? Um, we have the specifics to fill in still in terms of what that looks like but uh, you know we have experience within our board in, in repurposing a manufacturing space and we know that that's about five hundred thousand dollars so these estimates have come from our the staff that uh, are working to create similar spaces already uh, within our board so we we may be less um, than what's on here but uh, we want it we don't want to come back and say we underestimated what the cost would be Okay, and that exhausts the speaker's list. Thank you very much, Associate Director Bogue. So we are on to our third item for the June 6th meeting, 523, Fair Funding Awareness, Report 18087 on page 93 of your board package. Uh, Trustee Amos. Thank you. I'm very happy to be bringing uh, this uh, motion forward. This has been a lot of hard work by a majority of the trustees around this board about trying to determine a path to try and share an awareness about how um, boards are funded and um, how we in particular are the one of the lowest we are the lowest funded English public school board in the province so we felt it was important to try and raise awareness because I believe many in our own community don't realize that um, we have such low funding because um, I'm not sure they even pay attention to it. So we thought that this type of a program would be something of an awareness piece that they could then go advocate on behalf of our board and which would hopefully would actually um, create maybe um, the potential of having the funding formula actually looked at by the province um, overall for all boards. Um, so anyways, the motion is here and we'll be coming back in three weeks. Okay, there are no speakers. Oh, yes, there is a speaker. <laughs> Trustee Graves. Thank you. I, um, 
I, I agree to the the majority of what's uh, what's in this motion. The the one piece I'm going to struggle with is um, I think when we, we first set this motion in, into place the to, to set up the committee it was about fix the finances and it, it talks about the the provincial funding. The piece of it I'm a little bit concerned about is the awareness around our being the lowest funded board. What I don't want to do is have Halton set themselves up so that they're advocating for more of a piece of the pie. Um, we need more pie, uh, especially with regards to special education, which all all boards in our province are overspent on. So I, I am wholeheartedly behind that type of advocacy. Um, I, I'd be concerned about anything that would advocate only for Halton's uh, bigger bigger piece of the pie so um I, I have a lot of thinking to do i think in the in the next two weeks and um yeah i think i'll leave it i'll leave it there thanks okay thank you now i'm hungry okay um moving on to uh information items for this evening we have two information items. The first is number 531, annual school hours report. Superintendent Thierman, report 18083, page 94 of your board package. Welcome, Superintendent Thierman. Thank you, through the chair. As was mentioned, this is an information item. It is a report that's brought forward every year. The first report deals with uh, the request for annual school hour changes and the information provided by General Manager Lacroix of the Halton uh, Student Transportation Services provides uh, quite a bit of information with respect to, uh, to the requests and the process that has been, um, has been uh, um, conducted. On pages two, three of the report, it identifies for the Halton Board uh, the changes that uh, have been approved, um, as was, uh, um, a question was raised with respect to, uh, I believe it was Park uh, School and the 10 minute uh, start time and time adjustment. It was going from a 40, 40 50 to 240, so it is still within the, um, the approved or the, um, the required time frames. At this point, I'd be pleased to answer any questions. At this time, I see no questions. So we will move on to number 52, sorry, 532, Annual Transportation Review Report. Welcome thank, again. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, uh, there are uh, two items. Um, uh, I'm sorry, there's three items that uh, uh, have resulted in a change or uh, the, re the removal of an exemption. Uh, they are Florence Mears, Robert Little, and Ethel Gardner, and the rationale and uh, the information uh, is provided in the report. And again, I'd be pleased to answer any questions. So far, no speakers on the list. Thank you very much, Superintendent Thurman. Next is number five four, notices of motion. Are there any notices of motion? Seeing none. Next we have the director's report. Director Miller. Thank you, Chair Gravens. To buy myself some time, I'm going to refer to Superintendent Hunt Gibbons. No, she's got a different one. Certainly, through, through the chair and for the director, um, I would like to start off with some uh, wonderful news to ensure that everyone is aware with regard to our most recent skills competition at Ontario Skills. And we had a wonderful showing of Halton strength and great success and students going on uh, to the Canadians. So I, I, I don't have names in front of me, but I do have the schools and the categories. So electrical installations, M.M. Robinson, a bronze. Landscape design, White Oak Secondary School, a bronze. Auto paint, Craig Kielberger Secondary, a bronze. 
robotics and control system team of two, Craig Kielberger, a bronze. TV and video production team of two, Milton District, a gold. Mechanical, CAD, Burlington High School, a gold. And our gold medal winners uh, uh, going on to compete at the Canadian-wide event in Edmonton from June 1st through 6th. And uh, just as a final aside, our gold medalist in Mechanical CAD also scored the highest score of any secondary competitor in any competition. So we had wonderful showing and great success, and we wish everyone who is moving on even more luck as they move forward. Thanks. As always, thank you, Superintendent Hunt Gibbons. Uh, I, have I have two more items. The first is last board meeting I mentioned uh, we had a teacher in our board who won the Prime Minister's Teaching Award for Excellence, Charlotte Travis from uh, um, Bruce T. Lindley. Thank you. And But we actually had two, and I didn't have that name at the time. So Sean Elsie from Els from John Boych. And I paid a visit to John uh, last, uh, Sean last week at John Boych. Um, so congratulations to Sean because he is our second recipient. Many boards don't have a single person who wins a Prime Minister's Award for Teaching Excellence, and we now have two. So well done to Sean and Charlotte. The, the next item, and this is for trustees' uh, knowledge, information, is tomorrow we will be flying the pride flag. And I'll turn it over to Superintendent Etoff to give any kind of explanation. Uh, yes, you'll see uh, you'll see the rainbow flag, uh, pride flag uh, flown uh, at various different points uh, over the coming weeks. Uh, tomorrow, May the 17th, is uh, International Day Against Homophobia, Transphobia, and Biphobia. Um, our director uh, raised that uh, raised the pride flag last year uh, on that date, um, uh, and we we were able to tweet that out. And I, I believe that's our plan again tomorrow, uh, in order uh, to recognize and support. Uh, the need for inclusive and expansive uh, gender inclusive uh, environments across our schools. Um, while I have the mic, I'll also let you know that messaging is going out to our, our system uh, tomorrow with, with respect to uh, a direction and our support uh, for various different ways that they can um, uh, acknowledge uh, Pride Month, which is June. Um, which uh, which uh, will include um, at, uh, at many of our sites uh, a flying of the of the rainbow flag among uh, many other um, learning experiences uh, for students and staff. And that concludes my director's report. Thank you. Okay, next we have communications from the chair. Uh, just drawing attention in the package to two letters that were. Um, Actually, I think just the one is in there right now, the Osta Echo election issues. Um, but there was also the uh, CFUW Chamber of Commerce um, letter that went out. And just a note on that, that uh, Trustee Jean Gray is actually attending the, that's where she is this evening, she's attending the CFUW uh, All Candidates debate in Halton Hills. And I understand from an email that the question, one of the questions that we sent in was the first question asked at the debate. So, excellent. Uh, some of the, uh, there's a few other things I need to mention. Um, that we are having a special board meeting May 22nd, I'm sorry, May 23rd, uh, just before Committee of the Whole. It will be a, a private session though. And then we'll be, um, I'm sure uh, Vice Chair Al Harrison will give us some details about co what's coming up in community reports for a community of the whole. Uh, also, student excellence was last week, and it was great seeing uh, trustees out and giving out awards. Um, it was a wonderful night, all of the high heels and uh, <laughs> uh, big smiles with families, and it was just a wonderful evening. And a special um, thank you to M.M. Robinson's band and W.H. Morton's drumline for coming out to entertain us as well. And uh, also, a number of people uh, attended the Viola Desmond Awards at Ryerson University on Friday night. Um, trustees Daniele, Harvey Hope, Graves, uh, as well as Superintendent Newton, and a number of staff 
from the school uh, that will be opening in the fall um, attended as well. It was a spectacular evening. Uh, Viola Desmond's sister was there and a number of people met her. Uh, and um, yeah, certainly a night to be remembered. So I believe that's all from me. Do we have any committee reports? Trustee Reynolds. Uh, thank you. Uh, I attended the uh, Center for Skills uh, Development and Training uh, board meeting today and I just thought I'd pass on um, some uh, exciting news uh, on their behalf. Um, they've created a tiny homes project and um, this is a, a project that they've done in collaboration with um, many stakeholders um, and they're going to be sharing it out at the um, at the Rotary Rib Fest um, and that is in Oakville on June 22nd to 24th if uh, you're at all interested in checking out a new um, opportunity that they are their their um, their uh, students have been putting this together it's actually we saw a picture of it today it's uh, built on a platform ready to roll um, I don't believe the inside is is complete but uh, it will be done for that event Vice Chair Al Harrison. Thank you very much. I have two quick committee updates. Uh, firstly, Committee of the Whole, May 23rd, we will be talking about respectful workplace survey uh, budget, including trustee budget lines, and then uh, looking at self-evaluation of board evaluation uh, processes. If anybody has any other items to add to that agenda, please uh, let me know. Just of note, we also have a short uh, private session scheduled as well. Uh, secondly, I attended the environmental management team meeting recently um, to dovetail in with the procedure related to phasing out um, single-use water bottles. Uh, every school now has or will have very shortly at least one water bottle filling station. Uh, and then secondly, in terms of building partnerships and collaborations with the community, uh, Halton Environment Network has partnered with Pilgrim, Pilgrim Woods and they're creating a canoe garden. Uh, and then lastly, uh, some students from Abbey Park uh, attended the meeting uh, to talk about their initiative to um, get rid of uh, drinking straws due to their uh, damage to the environment and flora and fauna. So uh, the group was very supportive of that initiative and it led to some really interesting discussions actually around things like milk program uh, and how they would be impacted if there were no more drinking straws. Uh, it was just, it was a really interesting meeting. Thanks. Any other committee reports at all? Seeing none, now we're going to go on to trustee questions and comments. Before we get started on that, I just, um, uh, Trustee Daniele, did you want to speak at all to your report on uh, ops for labor relations? Um, I, I don't believe so. The, um, the general overview is there of the workshops that were attended by Trustee Collard and myself. Um, and I will be forwarding my notes from each of the workshops that I attended. And I believe it is Trustee Collard's intention to do the same so that uh, we share the learning from that particular one. It was an excellent conference. Uh, we did learn quite a bit. The labor relations is not one that's as well attended as the other ops was, but the, the meat of it was really, really incredible. So uh, lots of good learning and we will share those notes with you. Thank you very much. Okay, Trustee Amos. Thank you. Last night we almost had quorum, but there was five of us, uh, Chair Grabentz, Vice Chair Harrison, uh, Trustee Oliver, and Trustee Daniele, as well as myself, who judged the secondary speech competition held at White Oak Secondary School. And the first and second place junior speech finalists both came from Oakville Trafalgar. And the senior competitors 
Um, the Brewer, uh, first place was Craig Kilberger, second place was uh, Central High School, and third place was White Oaks. And they all, the um, students gave amazing speeches. It made it very difficult on us. The uh, scoring was very close in most cases, so um, the top competitors, uh, it was uh, um, just a very fine line, but uh, it was a really great evening. It was, it was excellent. Uh, Trustee Pappen. Thank you. Um, on the same note, uh, Trustee Reynolds and I had the privilege of judging the Burlington Junior and Intermediate uh, Public Speaking Competition at Brand Hills Public School. Um, this was my second time. It was Trustee Reynolds' first time. So it was, it was a really good night. There were some excellent speeches. We actually had a few ties. It was really hard to decide, but I was quite amazed at the age-appropriate speeches that they gave. And uh, I hope to do it again in the future. Thank you. Vice Chair Al Harrison. Thanks very much. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, uh, two things. Last night we had, uh, last night, two nights ago, we had an Oakville Family of Schools meeting. I just wanted to thank uh, Superintendent Hunt Gibbons. Our topic was Ask the Superintendent. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> the questions were great, uh, and so was the information exchange. Um, secondly, uh, a week or so ago, Chair Grabentz and I were asked to uh, adjudicate a practice session for the Morden Concert Band and Drumline. Um, as we heard when we went that day, um, they achieved sort of a first uh, as an elementary school. They were invited to compete in the National Music Fest uh, against secondary uh, bands. And I'm really, really excited to report that they performed uh, this week and they achieved gold, which is, um, which is really something. Um, and also congratulations to all the other schools that were there uh, and did really, really great work. So congratulations. Thank you. Yes, I have to say I was blown away when I saw them last week. Um, I see no other questions or comments from trustees, so may I have a motion to rise and, not rise and reconvene, to, yeah, rise and re, uh, reconvene. reconvene into private session. Uh, Trustee Daniele, Trustee Amos, thank you, and just setting. There it is. All those in favor. That passes unanimously. We are now heading into private session. We will take a five minute recess. Okay, five minute recess. Thank you. <laughs> 